Good morning, everyone. My name is Sean O'Rourke. You're welcome to this latest discussion in the RDS Vision 2030 series. Uh, the discussion today will address the sustainability of Irish international trade, uh, given the current economic and long-term environmental challenges that we face. Our guests today are three experts who are very familiar. They represent, uh, very familiar with the whole challenge of exporting. Uh, they represent a strand of interests uh, who very much have uh, critical interest in the whole export of Irish goods and produce. Uh, I'd like to welcome Anne Randalls, Director of Corporate Affairs with Ornua. Also here, John McGrain, Director General of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, and also Simon McKeever, Director General, Chief Executive, I should say, of the Irish Exporters Association. Now, rather than me giving uh, an introduction as to who they are and what their background is. I think it's best we hear from themselves. Perhaps, Anne, you might begin to tell us a little bit about what you do with Ornua. Thank you, Sean. Good morning to everybody and all your brave souls who came out this morning. I'm very impressed. Um, so my name is Anne Mandels. I'm working with Ornua, formerly known as the Irish Dairy Board, um, 20 years plus experience of working on international trade. Um, before, uh, I've had two stints in Arnoux and, and before the recent one, I also spent four years in Brussels working as Secretary General of the European Dairy Trade Association. So dairy trade and economics is very much my background. Um, in Arnoux, um as Director of Corporate Affairs, I'm very much involved in trade and regulatory compliance issues. And obviously that spans everything in terms of the, the footprint of, of Arnoux. And then for those of you who need a bit more information about Arnoux, we're a five and a half billion euro turnover company. We've had two and a half thousand people working globally, 14 different businesses across the globe. And of course we are, and I will be mentioning this again, we are owner of the iconic Kerrygold brand, the Irish, Ireland's most important indigenous food brand in Ireland, which is now valued at over a billion euro. Yes, that's quite the landmark for you. We might return to that a little later. Yeah. Uh, John McGrain, the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, of which you are Director General. Thank you, morning, John, and thanks to the RDS for hosting. Yeah, um, so I'm John McGrain, and I have the honour of being the Director General of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, which is the uh, distinctive trade organisation obsessed with the idea of the trade and the well-being that comes from that trade between our two islands. Uh, contrary to popular myth, uh, they haven't gone away, you know. Uh, the two islands are still connected to, um, uh, by, by all sorts of means, the birds and the bees and the wind and the molecules don't know where any border is. And as a result, by being a small island next door to a slightly larger island in between two very large continents, uh, it's only natural that we would be uh, very important uh, connectors with each other on every level, but not least in terms of enterprise and trade. Uh, and as Anne has spoken about in the vital food sector and, and, its, uh, and its connections, uh, the trade between Britain and Ireland is... Uh, is one which uh, has, uh, despite the uh, bubbles of, uh, and, and, and uh, if you like, uh, undulations of Brexit in the last couple of years, it remains very strong indeed. Britain is Ireland's uh, largest two-way trading partner, uh, and that trade supports more jobs on the island of Ireland between farming and processing and, uh, and other trades uh, than any other trade that we do. So it's an important trade. We shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, and there are lots and lots of things going on that we can talk about about where we're going Indeed. next. And Sam McKeever, Director General of the Irish Exporters Association. Uh, you're coming to us in the morning after some very good news in terms of how exports performed last year. Yeah, I mean, we've had... Um, so the first 11 months of the, sorry, first of all, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Sean. I think I said to you, the last time I was sitting beside you, you scared the bejesus out of me. Um, and because uh, my daughter was sitting in the production booth in RTE, and I, she was able to tell me afterwards the conversation that was going, get him off that subject, get him off that subject. Um, so Sean and I have been talking to each other on a number of occasions. So I, I run the Irish Exporters Association. We're the representative body for exporters in mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, so we're a lobby group. Um, we do an awful lot of training and education. We've just set up the uh, Institute of Sustainable Trade, um, and that's all about professionalising our industry and also helping uh, individuals working in it um, to, to grow their knowledge and sustainability. We offer uh, programmes on and off the framework in, in relation to that. Previously, I worked in the British Embassy as their Director of Trade and Investment. Fascinating as well as setting up the the British Irish Chamber, and before that, 18 years in financial markets. 
you want me to answer the question about the, the trade? N no, no, we'll come back to that. Um, and yeah. just to get into some little detail again, positive background. Um, last year, a record year for milk prices and for farm profitability. What could possibly go wrong? Absolutely, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> We did have a stellar year last year, there's no doubt about it, and, and the back of the previous year as well in terms of COVID-19. So 2020 and 2021 have been uh, very, very good years for the, for the Irish dairy industry. But of course, uh, all you can do is, is, is account for your performance in the previous year or the year that you're in, and then you have to think about going forward. So, um, you know, we have, we have at the moment a resilient industry. We have an excellent industry. I'm sure I'll, give, I'll have an opportunity to explain more in terms of why that is, but it's very much backed on, on the quality of the product that we produce here in Ireland. It is ex extraordinary. Um, the Kerrygold brand has been a huge vehicle in driving the value of, of, of that industry as well. But, um, you know, there are short-term issues as to why commodity prices are high. Last year, we don't forget, we also had huge in, uh, input costs in terms of, of, of the Ukrainian uh, situation and all the rest of it. So looking forward, um, yeah, you, everyone's always going to say, where's the milk price going to be in the year ahead? What's, what's your projections? You just never know. There are always going to be is risks. There are always going to be issues short-term, uh, which we all have to deal with on a, on a continuous basis. But... Um, there are definitely challenges in the long haul, and the, the, the theme of today is sustainability. And we would see um, certainly the, 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 the obligations on, on the industry and the agricultural industry going forward in terms of um, climate change and our climate responsibilities as being quite a significant challenge. So there's a lot that can go wrong, but there's a lot that's going right. I think and Simon, I think the first thing I read on my phone on the news feed this morning was that, uh, surprisingly, uh, the population of China has fallen for the first time since whenever, with serious implications for uh, the, the, world, the Chinese economy and the world economy. That's just another element that has to be worked into the mix. So what's, what's your take as we set out on the year 2023 in regard to the kind of challenges exporters face? I think, I think, first of all, we were all going into Christmas looking at what next year might bring massive inflation, interest rates continuing to, to increase. I actually think the inflation thing has burst a little bit at this stage, so I actually don't think inflation is going to be as, um, as bad as people originally thought, with the next in interest rate hikes coming out of the various central banks probably being quarters or halves. So I think we're getting close to the, to the top of the interest rate cycle on that. Um, one of the biggest things that's concerning our members is the UK, what's going on in the UK. Um, I, going back to that interest rate picture, so you know the, the big central banks, the, the Fed, the ECB, Bank of England, so the three economies are facing very similar challenges. And the one that the UK is facing that the others aren't facing in the same way is that they haven't realised um, Brexit. Um, and Brexit is just going to keep on continuing. So what do you mean when you say they haven't realised Brexit? You just have to watch the television to realise that they, to, 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 to figure out. They that. haven't got Brexit done to borrow. Well, it's not that they got it done. It's, it's not that they haven't got it done, but I don't think the, the damage that Brexit's going to do to the British economy has come home to roost in the powers that be over there yet because there's so much political machinations going on. So you now have an adult running the country over there um, and you get a sense that things are going to move forward but you know our members are looking at the UK and a considerable number of them last year have hedged their whole sterling um, exposure out for the next 12 months so that's their they're worried in the short term about where the pound is going and it is weakening off at the moment and in a lot in the long term a number of them have said we're very seriously considering the level of investment that we have in the UK and whether we're going to con continue to invest in the UK. And when you, when you listen to the Kerrygold story, which I think is the Kerrygold is the number one uh, brand of butter in Germany from outside mm. of the country. Well, in, actually, number one brand in Germany. We'll stop. Number one brand in Germany. <laughs> Germany is now our second largest export market. Mm. Uh, so, but that, but that's, a, that's a phenomenal story because it wasn't there. John, pick up on, on Simon's point there about the UK and whether they do or don't realise about the implications of Brexit? Well, it's a very good thing that they haven't. Um, so the they haven't. That they haven't yet realised. The reality is that uh, Irish exports uh, 
have benefited greatly from the fact that Britain hasn't actually applied Brexit inbound to itself. And it's a, it's a fact that we don't talk about very much in public discourse. The reality is uh, Brexit was arranged by our British neighbours and applied by the EU, effectively inbound, uh, outbound from continental Europe in the main uh, uh, affecting exports into GB. GB hasn't really applied any uh, majorly disrupting uh, import controls. And if they did, and they won't, uh, we would be in serious jeopardy in our food and, and many other sectors. Let's look at the positive side of this. Um, there are, it's, it's a tricky thing when your biggest customer is going through some difficulty. And our biggest customer is going through some difficulty. Um, the reality is that needs to get worked out and we need to live with the consequences of that in the short term. Um, Britain eats between a third, British families eat between a third and a half of all the food we make every week. I mean, that's a big customer by any standards in any econ economic relationship. So we need to hold on to that market. We need to make sure that we're providing value the quality that we surely do, and that we continually innovate to make sure that we don't lose that extraordinarily important piece. And let, let, we're in a good place, Sean. Like, barely 50 years ago, a generation, this country was exporting our young on the hoof along with our cattle. You know, uh, it took T.K. Whittaker and Sean Lamass and good public servants amazing public servants, really, in the conditions of the time, to say, you know what, we need to look, look upwards and outwards. That was about saying, we, we're not just going to export cheap labour or attract, you know, uh, abusive capital rather than productive capital. And what we got was a wonderful education system, a fantastic inward investment strategy, and the investment in capital from other parts of the world to propel great Irish businesses from farm to fork and onwards and upwards. So we have that... But as Anne was alluding to, you can't sort of eat bread as soon forgotten on this stuff. You have, to, otherwise. you have to just keep going forward. You take what you've got, you make sure you don't lose it, and you go forward to the next foothills of Mount Erigal, as we would call it. And we might talk about what the future look like in that, looks like in that regard. Right, but how would your members and the people you represent uh, have adjusted, as we say, almost seven years on now from that Brexit vote? Uh, Business doesn't do politics. Business just wants to do business, and it does it on you know, rational market terms. Once it knows what the market terms are going to be, it adjusts, adapts, gets ready as quick as it can, and it actually holds on to the wonderful markets, uh, to the wonderful products and services that it right. provides. That's what business has done so far. It would be better if we had less uncertainty, and soon, hopefully, we will. And Simon, you and your organisation, I think, back to the, in the early days of Brexit, uh, before and after, were suggesting to your members what they needed to do was diversify, lessen their uh, dependence on the British markets. How has that been working out? It's, it's going pretty well. <coughs> Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yep, mm. it's, it's going pretty well. Mm. I mentioned Germany is now our second biggest export market. I think our next biggest ex export market is actually uh, Belgium, and that's because it's a big coordination centre for a lot of the pharmaceuticals that come off the country. And then the UK is next, but GB is actually about two places below that, and Northern Ireland is our, Northern Ireland's our ninth biggest export market at the moment. So companies have definitely gone further afield. On the, on the import side, a lot of manufacturing companies so, so that make things other than food um, have stopped sourcing goods from the UK because it's just too cumbersome. And they're actually sourcing it. A lot of it is coming in from Germany now. And they're finding the quality is far better. Um, it's, it's more pricey, mm -hmm. um, but they're standing less of the stuff back. So less of it is breaking down. So there is definitely more items coming into the country uh, from outside of the UK. <clears throat> right. And, and the... Um your Ornua is active, I think, in over 100 countries. So again, what kind of adjustments have you been making in the light of Brexit in the aftermath? Well, just on, on a general point, can I just say you know, kudos to Ireland Inc. and Ireland International because of all of the countries in terms of being prepared for Brexit, I think that, uh, that, that Ireland was more prepared than any other member state and certainly no, more prepared than our British partners and counterparts in, in, in terms of Brexit. And I think that one of the advantages, uh, one of the abilities that, that encouraged that was that we have this open trading mindset anyway. Um, for for the uh, for Ornua, we're exporting to 110 countries. So obviously, not all of them were in the European Union. So we have that we had that in-house knowledge and capability upon which to, to build on in terms of uh, what would trade with the UK look like in the future and how do we need to prepare ourselves for that. So, but it did require quite considerable. Um, 
more changing in terms of, of, of our commercial relationship as opposed to maybe on the operational side is that we, it ha we have in-house customs capability and knowledge and, and that sort of thing as it is. Uh, we had to obviously set up, re-establish re re ourselves and refocus re that, that trade in terms of, 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 of more on the commercial side. So for example, we would have used the UK just as an or, an, another um, storage area. We would, UK accounts for about 60% of of, of um, Irish cheddar, so 80% of our cheddar business is going to the UK, ourselves going to the UK. We would just come straight off a production line, straight over to the UK, and we would manage the stock and the sales from there. And then sometimes we would have an extra contract here in Ireland, and we needed to bring some product back again to, to, to meet, a, meet a contract here. That's all changed. You cannot have that free flow or all the rest of it. So it was that mindset, really, from the commercial side to say, we cannot use the UK just as another off, off point for, for, for Ireland. It is a completely separate third country market with the incumbent um, restrictions that that will bring in terms of, of flowing to flow backwards and forwards between Ireland and the UK. Those sort of things were particularly difficult. But the, but the flow of trade has continued. The, the, to John's point, the sales have continued. And a lot of that is to do with the fact that the UK is import dependent. Um, they need the product and, and therefore that's why, to a large extent, taking back control and that phrase of taking back control has had a completely different scenario. Can, and and these great bilateral the end, deals you know? that they were going to do in the aftermath of Brexit, um, there was a sense or a fear yeah. perhaps that Ireland could be disadvantaged because of the arrival of cheap food from be it South America or New Zealand or wherever. Yeah, and, and that, 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 that risk and that threat is still there. There's no doubt about that. Those, those um, third country trade agreements have not come into force yet. Some of them, and a number of them, particularly in terms of Australia and New Zealand, are going to be very agri-focused, yes. Um, but if you look at the... Um if you look at the strategy of those countries, so Australia and New Zealand, the UK is not nearly is not going to be as strategically important for them as, for example, their nearer markets around them. As we all know, and Brexit has shown us, is that there is a geographical pull in terms of trade. You will trade with your nearest and dearest and the, people, the markets closest to you. Uh, for Australia and New Zealand, yes, it is important for them. It will be important for them. There will certainly will be opportunistic trade, but in terms of a longer term strategic focus, will the UK be that for them? Not so sure, we'll have to wait and see. Simon, John was saying a few moments ago that uh, business does business, it doesn't do politics, but you do politics. You do a lot of lobbying, interacting with government departments, presumably with politicians in a leadership position. So how has that been going? I mean, are you getting the kind of support that your members need? Yeah, I think, I think we're, <clears throat> I think I mentioned beforehand that, I, that I'd worked in the British system beforehand. And in the British system, people are very distant from the politics. Um, in Ireland, there is literally only a couple of degrees of separation away from the politics. And my, my sense of working with government is that they do listen. And we've just been through three fairly big crises um, between uh, dealing with Brexit, where there was a concerted effort around the country, where we were all pretty united in trying to get ready for... Like, we were one of the big customs trainers. Um, um, and that was, you know, we, we, we were lucky in that we had developed all these training courses in 2017 and were able to deliver them. Uh, but then we went through COVID and the same infrastructure is put in place and now we've just been through all of the, um, the problems with the energy. So I absolutely found that um, government does listen. Um, there, is, there is a way of, um, I think, bringing people together in this country led by government. And when we start talking about um, sustainability, I think it'll take an approach similar to how we have, have acted as a country with Brexit and COVID and the inflation crisis to, to really move forward on uh, sustainability. I mean, that just the, you know, the difference between Ireland and Britain in terms of that political piece is, it always used to amaze me when we had a British minister over when I was working in the embassy. And invariably, the minister and his counterpart would end up in O'Donoghue's pub that night. And he just couldn't, the, he or she, the British minister, couldn't get over the fact that somebody would coming up and going like that to his counterpart in Ireland sitting on the, on the stool, whereas in Britain they're just so far removed from, from the people. So, so They've it, got all those bars in the House of Commons. <laughs> and, they do, you know, they do but there isn't... There, it's, it's a huge population. Mm. It, it's a massive population, and London is very distant from other parts of the country. And 
they just don't go about doing their business um, the way that we do. Just before I go back to Anne, you have, um, I think, coming down the track at us, uh, CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, landing on us from Brussels. Yeah. Explain. So, I j just to go slightly before that, so sustainability and what it means for Irish businesses um, and what's going to force people to make a change in all of that. So we are talking to a lot of our companies. If you're a very large organisation, you're probably doing a fair bit in relation to sustainability, but nobody's doing everything that they possibly should be doing in relation to it. And what is going to force change in that is, in, in my view, is legislation coming down the tracks. And there's three big ones coming. There's the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, um, which will force companies to put into their annual reports the impact that the that things that they are doing will have on society and sustainability. The EU taxonomy. Um, which will tell you from an investment point of view whether that investment meets certain sustainability uh, categories. And then the corporate, the corporate social uh, um, due diligence directive. So, so CSRD 2024 for large companies. Taxonomy is in place. The last bits of that come in this year. And then the CSDD, the due diligence one, which is all about um, um, human rights human rights and how you're treating that within your own company, but also right through your supply chain. Uh, that will come in in uh, 2026. They are absolutely going to force change in, changes in companies. The CSRD is, for larger organisations and organisations like ourselves, it's the next Brexit because it is going to absolutely going to force um, changes within companies because they're going to have to report it. And if you think as a small organisation that the CSRD means nothing to you, uh, because you will have um, smaller companies will have between two and four years um, to adopt the CSRD. If you're a large organisation and you're doing business with a small organisation, uh, because you have to report on the business that you're doing, you're going to force those smaller companies to um, to do it. So. Um, there will be 49,000 companies within the EU immediately impacted in 2020, uh, 2024, so they don't have to report until the very How many end. of those in Ireland? Oh, I couldn't, couldn't tell you, but it would be a very small proportion, mm -hmm. but it will be larger organisations that do it. Um, but that, but that, so, so it's based on the non-financial reporting directive which exists at the moment. There's 11,000 companies in Europe um, uh, uh, reporting in on that. There'll be 49,000 and then more of them. And I, I think that this is going to force change. And I, and, I, and I do believe that it will take an effort across both public and private to, to get the changes in, in Ireland that we need. And in addition to those, if I might describe them, and I don't intend this in a disparaging way, but mm. those kind of bureaucratic requirements, mm. we've also got the background of the, the National Climate Action mm. Plan, uh, the Global Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals. So set that against what you're trying to achieve, increasing Irish dairy exports. Yeah, and so you're right. It's it's, and and, and and sorry. On top of that, also you've got what the customers, your customer and your consumer is requiring as well. So you have the the hardcore legislative side. You have the the climate action and the the, the legal requirements for the sectors in terms of greenhouse gas reductions and particularly in terms of Ireland 20, um, agriculture 25 percent reduction by 2030. And then you have what the consumer is expecting from you as well, and indeed your suppliers and your your as well. So you have a conflation of a number of different pressures on you. So just to, to just briefly in terms of Simon's point, uh, you know, the companies, um, you know, that this is important and they may not have been considering their sustain, they're fully engaged in their, their sustainability obligations. I would say that most companies at this stage are well aware of the pressures and really have stepped up the game in terms of what their legal requirements are as opposed to, as well as what the market is requiring for them. So in terms of, of, of agriculture, and terms, certainly in, in, in particular in terms of dairy, I mean, uh, you know, we've had a massively expanding in, um, industry over the last um, um, decade, uh, predicated on the back of the removal of, of milk quotas in, in Ireland, which uh, really was a huge constraining factor on Ireland's capability to produce, because we have a huge capability to produce wonderful, wonderful dairy products. Um, and that, that, that removal of quotas led to this expansion. We knew it was going to come, and farmers were encouraged to do it. Uh, and then 10 years later, there's a, the brakes are put on because of, of the climate action uh, obligations and the climate action pla plan. So we are in, uh, on, on foot of the, um, the record 
exports uh, from, from that Board Via um, uh, published last week, which is 6.8 billion euros worth of dairy exports, where um, Ireland is feeding 50 million people worldwide. There is a, a huge um, projections of increase in, in, in the requirements for food, in the doubling of food. Uh, there is a doubling of uh, the people who are facing acute food shortages since 2019. So there's a huge amount of challenges. There's a huge amount of opportunities for dairy, there's a huge amount of opportunities for agriculture in general, and yet we have then this obligation to meet our climate, our, our, our climate change obligations as well. And that is a huge challenge for the industry and it's something which we're grappling on, it's something which we have obviously mm. taken on board seriously, um, but it is something which we will be, have to work through quite considerably yeah, over the next few we'll years. We'll come back to just some of the, the yeah. more granular detail, yeah. if we may, on that in, in a few minutes. Uh, John, is, is agriculture still the main uh, area of activity for Irish exporters to the UK, the, the people you're dealing with? Oh, agriculture is a huge component of that, but it's by no means the only one. I mean, our financial services sector, which, you know, like we can see boxes of butter, we can see wonderful, you know, branded, manufactured products, and not least in the food sector, uh, but you can't kind of see and feel financial services in the air. It's a huge export. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and lots and lots of other things as well. So, like, just thinking about this, this phase, Sean, in, in, in your discussion, um, aren't these wonderful challenges to have? You know, CSR, you know, uh, the whole corporate and social responsibility piece. I mean, that's what business does, it mm. acts responsibly. Uh, the whole climate change piece. I mean, we're burning down, and the only way to stop burning down is for business to be enabled to be the answer to the problem, not the cause of the problem. And the people will support that, and policy will support that. So, you know, as we said earlier on, business just wants to know what's the rules, and indeed will participate very fully as a, as a corporate citizen in its own right in, in forming rules that can work and rules that can be applied at a digestible level. Because there's no point in just, you know, hitting people over the head and saying, here's a report. We kind of know how the, how the outcomes work from that. Fill in the report, get your exam and all of that. The reality is that when we talk about sustainability, we have to talk about sustaining the businesses that will determine that sustainability. Yeah. And the good news is, we're in a great place in this country. Ireland is green by nature. We have suddenly got you know, an asset register that looks like one of the most attractive in the world. Our land, our wind, our seas, and our brains. And I mean, if that doesn't get us home, what will? It's up to us now to put a policy framework in place to leverage those brilliantly, and then we'll be the world leader in that, just as we are in food today, and we, and we are in tech, and we are in with the best research universities, and many other successful factors. But we need to think about, are we sustaining the businesses on this island that will be the determinant of whether we'll succeed with those factors of, of productivity? Simon? Two, two, two asides on it, um, because I was looking at the CSO figures yesterday, when you look at our trade with Britain, do you know what the biggest increase in imports from the UK has been in the last year? Oil, gas, um, anything to do with fuel. And had it not been for that, we would have actually imported less from Britain this year than we did last year. Um, and so when you look at inflation and you really drill down into those CSO figures, you can see the effect of the, the, the oil, price of oil and the price of the dollar on, on um, the imports coming in from, uh, from the UK, which is um, it, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and then if you, if you also look back in those figures throughout the year, you'll see that we've been bringing all this temporary power generation equipment in just to deal with what was, what was happening in the, um, in the middle part of the year. And I've completely forgotten what I was going to say in the other piece. Okay, I was just suggesting... My sure, just to pick up, up on, on the point about sustaining businesses. I mean, we're, we're in a good place, but there are a lot of constraints... Um, let's look at the positive side of this. If we fix a few things, we will be world best in, in pretty well everything. What things? We, so let, let's take pretty down-to-earth stuff like planning, like businesses who want to invest to expand a factory or a research unit or other such factors um, and face you know, five years of planning delays when that's, just, that's within our power is to say, we don't need to have five years of planning delays. Businesses that are producing domestically 
that aren't supported by our wonderful state agencies like the IDA, with fantastic inward, inward investment support structure, or indeed Enterprise Ireland, who do great work with ultimately a relatively limited number of exporters. But like, let me give you an example. You can't run an IDA factory and export the boxes of things without somebody to collect the waste. That waste company is probably quite a large company. It's probably Irish family owned, and it definitely doesn't get support from the ADA or Enterprise Ireland, and it's too big for the local Leo. That's a vital factor in the local supply chain, and it's, you know, we're, not, we're not saying we should hand out money, but we should think about are we, are we making sure that we're, we're sustaining the businesses that sustain the big exporters and the big FTIs. And you know, the local Centra shop in Arva is just as important to the, uh, you know, the Smith family in Abcon uh, exporting uh, equipment out to GB. We, we, we have an enterprise strategy, it's just been updated, and it doesn't mention anything about sustaining the non-exporting or non-potential exporting local service and, and productive businesses. And the, the reality is our indigenous businesses, typically local Irish family owned over a couple of generations, employ more than twice the aggregate of the FDI sector and the state that, sector. And we need to actually that update is possibly the way we support these people. That is for another discussion as opposed to well, no, uh, international it, exports. With respect, John, it's, it is fundamental to the sustaining of the businesses that will make Ireland sustainable. Yeah, and to come back to something you touched on mm. uh, just a few minutes ago, um, the climate challenges and so forth. I mean, it's interesting, again, looking at your own recent reports, um, you say that uh, there's been an 18% reduction in manufacturing emissions, that, uh, for instance, uh, other countries have double our carbon emissions per litre of milk produced. But in the context of this target of 25%, contribution from the, yeah. the, the agriculture side, that's not quite going to cut it, is it? Well, no, that's not quite, no, it's certainly not. There is just, and I think I, I referenced and the it fact already, that we're better is, on our green uh, dimension and our grass-fed, yeah. th that's not going to, uh, to mix my metaphors, or mix my vegetables, butter any parsnips <laughs> <laughs> with the people so, who are making these rules. Okay, so there is, there's a bit of a dichotomy between what the consumer wants, because that resonates very well with the consumer, because mm. the consumer is looking for, when they go into the supermarket, they're looking for the least carbon are the lowest carbon emitting product on the, on the supermarket shelf. That's very, very important in terms of the sales part of it. Um, but certainly, yes, we have a legal obligation in terms of we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 25%. And the great unmentionable is we can't reduce the size of the dairy herd. We, we, do we need to, my question to you back would be, do we need to reduce the size of the dairy herd. It's a, it's a very simple, easy solution there, and it's one which a lot of people, and it gets great headline news, but is it the requirement to do that? So we, the, the sector, um, together with some very great support and research from Chagask, is showing that we are significantly down the road. We have the capability significantly down the road to meet that 25%. Is that a bit like, though, the, the British, sorry to cut across you, yeah. and say, oh, technology will sort all our problems at customs and so forth, that, like, science will rescue us, we won't actually have to take any pain. Well, we're hoping that that is the case, and, and like, don't debunk science and technology in the, in the RDS, you know, like, it's very, very important. It has a huge role to play in terms of all of this, and, uh, you know, I was speaking to somebody from the dairy industry in Northern Ireland, and they were saying, you know, one of the, the principles that they're adopting is do no harm as much as you can in terms of meeting your obligations, and that's very, very important. There is huge unknowns yet, there's a lot of questions still to be made in terms of how do we get to the 2025 but in, also in terms of what are the exact emissions from the dairy industry as well. Um, and, you know, and an awful lot of focuses in terms of methane and a lot of technical questions involved in that, you know. So what we don't want to be doing is taking decisions in 2025 or 2024 which are going to have a significant impact which we won't be able to roll back from and which maybe we're not necessarily because there are solutions out there. And there are significant solutions which are not on that unknown mm -hmm. technical side that will give us, a, that will bring us 75% there already and we know that but just to John's point in terms of that joined up thinking I think we do need uh, you know we we have we have clear targets, we have action plans, but there is a lot of policy out there, a lot of government, uh, government policy, which we do need an awful lot more integrated. We need a lot more consistent, we need a lot more clarity, and we need a lot more integration in order to be able to support the agriculture industry and the other pillars that are required in the action plan as well. I go back to what I said earlier on. We've just been through three crises. 
um, where the country came together at both a political and a business level and a societal level. How are we going to deal with Brexit? How are we going to deal with COVID? How, how do we deal with the inflation crisis? <clears throat> and I actually do, do think it takes a whole joined up approach. Um, so how are we going to deal with um, sustainability, with CSRD? I mean, here, here, here's a question. How does Ireland remain a attractive destination to have manufacturing um, going on in Ireland in an environment where we are, um, you know, we are peripherally located uh, off the coast of Europe. Um, we are very important to the, you know, we're sitting in the middle of the supply chain between the US and the European Union. One thing that may, so, so if you look at the carbon footprint of the transport sector that's bringing stuff on and off this island, how do we reconcile that moving forward to, and this is the challenge, so I, I actually don't think it's, it's a very simple thing, I think. So how do you break it down into each individual sector? How are we going to get more trucks to be um, electric? You have to actually break it down into every single little piece. So, so there is a big question about how we remain a, an attractive destination to site manufacturing businesses in this country going forward, given sustainability and all the challenges that come with it. We began with questions. We finished with questions. Uh, Simon, you've had the last word. Uh, I want to thank you, Simon McKeever of the Irish Exporters Association and Randall's corporate, uh, Head of Corporate Affairs with Ornua and John Grain of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. Thank you all for being with us for this discussion. Please, uh, at the RDS this morning, please show your appreciation.